this guy, uh, well, I'm just going to put up his bio, and then I get to talk about him for a minute. Uh, Dan Bossy, truly, um, I have the opportunity to meet a lot of people. This is actually one of the smartest guys I've ever met, and I mean that sincerely. Yeah, but I mean, I don't meet a lot of smart guys, but I met you are smart, yeah, really, truly. No, here's the thing. Dan absolutely has a global perspective on our industry, and that's why he started the business, Ag Resource, back in 19, uh, in, what, when was that, 87, I guess, started Ag Resource Company, and his whole purpose is to supply and support information so that people can make better decisions to our industry. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome your speaker, Dan Bossy. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate being with you. We got a lot of talk about this morning. There's a lot happening in our world of agriculture. I think Charlie Plum set it up yesterday a little well for me, talking about $25 an acre less than where we've been. And yes, the egg markets are somewhat depressed. We are in a cyclical business. That doesn't mean they always stay depressed, but that's where we are today. But I'm here to tell you, or at least explain to you, why we think we're depressed, what to watch for going forward, and way, maybe where the opportunity is. And a big thanks to, uh, to Maristem, if you will, to help uh, to get me here and to at least have you talk today. I just finished last week talking to the fertilizer industry down in Nashville. They had about 3,000 fertilizer reps down there, and we were talking about the same stuff. Egg markets have been coming down. As you think about where the egg markets have been, whoa, we got some animation difficulties here. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Wow. Can, can we go back and do this, the other slide set that I gave you this morning that, that we went through, if that would be OK? Just take a little pivot here. Sorry about that. I had a slide set I went through earlier, which seemed to be all right. This one seems to be a little different. And I want to make sure we just get back on track. Here we go. All right. And if you would give me the clicker ability on that, that would be great. Anyway, what we're talking about here and where I wanted to highlight is we have a summer row crop that's a biggie. We have CBOT prices at our multi-year lows, and we have a tractor in the background, but again, soon to come up and help us as we go forward. Do you think that one will work better? I have no idea. All right. Sorry, everyone, for the technical ability here. We'll get moving through right away. Here we go. All right. Thank you again. Let's start us out here in the beginning, and then we'll give it another shot here. Um, as you think about where prices have been, everybody should understand, when I do my work at Ag Resource, we're doing it in the cash markets. We are basing our issues on cash. So when I go talk to my friends, whether it's Russia, France, United States, or Argentina, everything is coming down. And whether it's the world wheat market, whether it's the world corn market, or whether it's the world soybean market, we have been in a bearish trend, as all of you know, for the last couple of years. After, after about 2022, when the Fed started raising interest rates, grain prices have been coming down. The one thing I do want you to remember or look at is if you look at Ukraine way down here, notice that green line is Ukraine. Now, what has happened in Ukraine is they've had a drought in the Black Sea, and so Ukrainian corn prices are coming up to reflect their dryness. This morning, Ukraine is well above the United States in terms of opportunity. When we look at the global grain production, and there's some lessons I want you to take home today. Look at global grain production where we are today relative to where consumption is. And so this year, we will find global grain consumption being down slightly. There's flooding in China. There's problems in Ukraine. We in the Midwest have been blessed with very good weather. Our crops are bigger. But when I look at the world, we'll be down slightly. But global grain con consumption is still reaching record highs. Now, in terms of world planted area, I want you all to drill down and understand that the world brings on acres as it needs it. That's the job of the market. 
So if it needs acres, and we will need about approximately 20 million acres in the next three years, the market will do the job. So we've seen stagnation in global grain crop area because the markets don't need extra production this year. When I look at it per capita wise, though, we've, we're seeing it relatively stable as we're bringing more people on the planet, we're not seeing those acres go up. Now here in the United States, as we look at planted acreage, and we'll get an update on this on the 12th of August from USDA, we're looking at around 91 and a half million acres of corn and 86.1 million acres of soybeans. As you look at the state, you can pick your favorite state out there on the left, you can see where it comes in. Now, we think, or Ag Resource, but well, to our studies, think that these numbers could come down a little bit. We could maybe lose a million acres of corn and maybe some 500,000 or so acres of soybeans. I think as you think about the markets, this will be important heading into the August crop report. But again, somewhere along the line, you need to understand that the United States is maxed out. We call it top, uh, we call it peak acres in terms of corn and soybeans. We're not planting more than 178 or something like 180 million acres combined. As we look at yields this year, yields are record large. We saw our first estimate from a private entity yesterday, Stone X. They came out with a corn yield of 182. We had egg resource at 179.7. We came out with a soybean yield of 52.6 or 52. We are at slightly 52.2. So this is a big crop as you've all driven here to Wisconsin. You've seen the fields of lush green that are out there. There's some holes along the way in Minnesota, South Dakota, even in Wisconsin, Louisiana. But generally speaking, this is a very good yield and a very good crop. So this year, relative to that, we've got stocks in the United States going up. That's why Chicago is going down. Notice when you look at 2020 or 19 and 20, we started to see crop stocks going down, but that has reversed in the last couple of years. We're now into a bear market because of that stock's increase. This is corn, soybeans, and wheat stacked upon themselves. Now, how does this affect you all? It's tough. I mean, a picture says it all. These are hard times. Farmers struggle with, low co with cost, margins, and prices. The combination is not good. I'm sure Charlie talked about it yesterday. We'll get new updates from the USDA. But when you look at farm income, net farm income, it's the largest two-year drop on record at $69 billion, or 37%. Now again, I'm not here to blow smoke up anybody's skirt. This is the data. I can't help it. I wish it was different. But it is what it is. In fact, we had others, if we go back to 2012, when we lost ethanol, we dropped into 2017, a similar drop as you can see right there. You can pick your area, whether it's the heartland, 31%, Northern Plains, 34 You can see your area of the country. The market drop, if you will, has produced this sharp drop in net farm income. Now, we are back to the 10-year trend line. I do expect an update on this data coming forward in the next couple of weeks. We'll probably be about $112 billion, if you will, so a little lower than this. But it is reflective of where we are in agriculture today. If I look at where your break-evens are in terms of corn and soybeans, our analysis along with US, uh, uh, the state of Illinois, we can see here I put a little red dot for both corn and soybeans. That's the calculated break-even coming into the uh, crop year. We validated with producers. We see it to be generally right. And so when you look at this, we're looking at about $4.69 on corn, $11.77 on soybeans. Notice, if you will, that I have variable costs overhead nearby Chicago and new crop, we are now into that point where we're cutting into the overhead costs. Markets don't stay into the green very long. That would be, of course, the variable and land costs. So maybe if we drop down to 370 to 350 relative to corn, soybeans, maybe down into that, oh, we call it 950 to eight dollar level, that would be the ultimate that I could see on the downside. But it's still lower than where we are today. So when you look at this, this is the problem with net farm income in terms of where we are today. The only good news, farmland values have not come down yet. That's holding balance sheets together. So when you get to talk to your friendly banker, you can see here that 
When we look at the last year, farmland values have done relatively well, even with rising interest rates. Now, I do not expect this to continue. We expect stagnation. But when you look at where farmland values are, and I can plot corn prices against Illinois cropland, you can see where we're generally holding. I expect Illinois farmland prices to come down a little bit or soften, but I don't see a big break ahead here, at least for the land market as it sits today. In fact, when I go to my friends and I talk to Wall Street, I tell them all, you know, farmland values have outperformed the stock market, at least going backwards to 2000. So when you look at valuations, you can see the performance and the change here, whether it's Illinois cropland or the total. And so it has been a good investment. And again, we are in a cyclic business. It doesn't always happen that we go up all the time. There are periods that we get overproduction and prices go down, things soften. But at the moment, we need to take some solace, at least in the land market. Today, the stock market's down another 400 points this morning as the jobs report wasn't relatively good. We only added about 114,000. Yesterday, it fell 500 points. So at least your farmland is looking a little better this morning relative to the S&P. So where are we economically speaking? When we at Ag Resource break down our economics, we do it in terms of 99 to 08, 2009 to 18, 19 to 28. I segregate it because as we started 2020, we got into the pandemic. Now I want your eyes to look at places like China or maybe Latin America or India. As you think about where we are today, the world economic growth rates are not where they were in the last couple of decades. And the one country that's struggling the most is China. China has real difficulties with its real estate market in terms of overcapacity and, and, and declines. And everyone in China sees real estate as being their 401k for the future. And so Chinese growth is going to be constrained both by population, but also because of what's going on structurally within its country. So if there is an area that offers opportunity for agriculture, it is going to be India. And that will be, the next, that will be the next tipping point, if you will. And we believe India is on that point where it can no longer feed itself. It will be the next opportunity. But it's really vegetable oils and wheat that will be the ones that change in the world marketplace substantially. But we're beginning to be very positive of India. Now, we had an inflation report just a few, a few days ago. It showed that inflation was come down to around 2%. Notice when I plot commodities, this is something called the CRB index. This is a basket of 28 commodities relative to the CPI, which is measuring inflation. Notice how closely they followed each other. Esther George, when I showed her the Kansas City Fed, she was amazed at this relationship. And I believe it's something we all need to be paying attention to. Commodity prices have been a very good leader, if you will, of what's going on with inflation. That said, if you look at the inflation or the CRB rate, we had this big run up from 2019 to 2021, and now we've gone sideways. Is any of your grocery bills getting smaller? Is your gas bill getting substantially smaller? It's just stopped going up, right? It's not getting smaller, but the measure that the Fed uses means that we're seeing the inflation rate starting to stagnate, but at a much higher level than where it's been. And that's the key point and the key ingredient that you need to remember. Why is inflation so sticky? If there's a graph I kind of want to burn into your mind today and take home, this would be one of them. When I look at the working population of age 15 to 64 years old, David and I are baby boomers. We grew up in this booming economy in which we were adding somewhere between, we'll call it one and a half to maybe three million people every year. Then the millennials came along. But America is now in this position where we cannot keep the employment growth going unless we have an immigration policy that works. So when I look at this graphic, I'm going to here to tell you that as I speak with my corporate customers and I sit in boardrooms, one of the things we talk about is the shortage of workers as far as we can see. If I model this all the way out to something like 2040, I'm looking at where we'll be losing a half to one and a half million people from the workforce 
each and every year. This isn't going to change. For you in the farm, finding help will become difficult, more difficult, and the competition for wages will continue to increase. The fast food industry has definitely been hit very hard by all of this. So again, we are in a different cycle that will persist. The only way to fix it is through immigration. Women are not doing their job. They're only having 1.6 kids per family. That's enough to keep it all going. So again, you can't have a sixth of a tenth of a kid. I know that. But in a general sense, I want you to be aware of we're just not to the point yet where we're really building in terms of our workforce. And this is a much different landscape than where we've been before. The other different landscape is that our central bank and the US government keep spending money faster than we can print it. We're now up to where we're doing a trillion dollars every 100 days. A trillion dollars every 100 days. And so when you look at this debt and you look at the forecast from the OMB, which we're going forward, it really gets to be rather scary in terms of where the debt will go. Well, you should be sitting there thinking, well, who is buying the $35 trillion of debt in this country we have right now? And it's not our friends in China. China stepped back in terms of being a significant buyer back when we started the trade war with them in 2018. Notice that China is now buying less US debt or treasuries. And the big increase has been to Europe. Europeans have come to the day and bought our treasuries. Now, I talk to my European hedge funds or our clients, and they say, this is all fine as long as the dollar keeps strengthening. There's a story to invest in US debt. But if the Europeans step away, which they are fickle buyers, and the dollar starts to weaken, or the euro starts to, to, to strengthen, this could be a big change in terms of what interest rates will do. Now, commodity prices and the value of the dollar go inverse. In my world as an economist, when you've got some, more of something, right, prices should do what? Go down. You have more of something, prices go down. We got, we're printing dollars every day. We got 35 trillion a year, but the dollar has only come down a little bit. Nonetheless, if you look at commodities in blue and red, you can see here how they've traded inversely, at least until the last couple of, uh, couple of years. I think that the dollar is going to weaken. I don't think it's going to be a substantial break all at once. I think it's going to be a gradual break. But nonetheless, the only reason we're not weakening more is because there's no other place to put it. You can't put it in Chinese yuan. You're not going to be putting it in euros. They're having their own problems. Russian rubles, forget it. So when you think about this mixture, we're in a place where the dollar will weaken, but the problem is there's still not a other, another spot to put your currency. I have an office in Brazil. In fact, most of my research staff I like in Brazil in my IT department because it, it's so much cheaper than keeping someone in the US. I can hire a master's degree or PhD in Brazil for something around $25,000 a year. And they love to work. And so for me, it's easy to keep people in Brazil. Another reason which makes it easier on me is what the government is doing down there. So if you're in agriculture in Brazil, you pray for a bad government. Why? Because the value of the real. The real is a currency in Brazil. If I look at soybean prices since January 1st, we are down 9%. If I, and this was updated last week. It now be about 11%. And for the Brazilian farmer, because of the weakness in real, they're up 2%. This gives the Brazilian farmer that advantage. And they keep expanding. And so one of the things that I'm watching for, if you're looking for a change in American agriculture, global agriculture, would be a change and a strengthening of the real. But with President Lula down there struggling to balance the budget, and they are a big debtor country, and they are not the reserve currency of the world, it is a mighty effort to do that. And I'm not sure he can get it done. He comes out with different tax proposals, but Brazil is a, a virtual economic morass in a mess, and I'm not sure it'll be cleaned up any day soon, but this is the advantage that Brazilian farmers have. So if I put this all together, and I want to tell you maybe where we're at. I've, done, I've overdone myself here. I've gone back and looked at world interest rates since 
3000 BC, going back a long, long time. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to show to you how unusual the last 16 years were before we started to raise interest rates. I go back to the Greeks and the Romans, and I start to use a little bit of the Italians when they started their banking systems, and we put this all together at Ag Resource. How many years has interest rates been at zero or negative across the globe in the last 5,000? 33. It is not normal to, print, to lend money at zero. It's just not normal. Normally in the banking world, you lend money to get a return. But because of some weakness, whether it's the depression of the 1930s or the stagnation of growth that we had because of an aging population in some parts of the world, we had interest rates that low. Now, as the US is ramping up towards $40 trillion by 2026, and the crowding is the debt markets are there, I don't think interest rates are going back to zero. I think we're more in this normality now, trading between, let's call it, 3 and 7%. I think those are anomalies. But you and your farming operations, I want you to understand that the days of 0% interest are unlikely to come forward unless this US economy gets very, very soft, something I'm not seeing here today. You know, I know we're not talking about grain prices right now, but there's some things I really want to leave in your mind. And one of them is the new geopolitical landscape. It's a new world out there. Remember about globalization, where the United States was at the center of the world, politically and economically. If you took a vacation to the Philippines, Mexico, Italy, they knew what was happening in America. We were it. Those days have now changed, and we are now in what we call a duopoly or a bipolar world. Very important to understand. We went from a unipolar world where the US was a sole superpower and the economic globalization that powered everything. Cheaper goods from China came in, kept inflation down. We're now at a point where we're at a bipolar war where the United States and China are the, at competition. The power is in Washington and Beijing. Both are sharing it. And we're now in what we call geoeconomic globalization. When I think about the BRICS, and the BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, they're now 32% of world GDP. 42% of the oil they produce, and they're stockpiling. The Chinese have been massive buyers of gold. Gold prices have been at record highs, $2,500 an ounce. China has been buying a lot of that. When I look at G7, that's us, we're 30% of GDP. We have massive government def deficits. We're printing money. And because of the, what we call the Russian war, we're weaponizing the dollar as a foreign policy. So this is where we get to this duopoly in terms of world economic and political power. When I think about China, and I go back to 2000, they had something called a Belt and Road Initiative. And in China, we were basically looking at these countries aligning themselves back then. And I asked the question of, who would you call if you wanted to trade? Today, China here has aligned the Belt and Road to include most of South America, Africa, Asia, and portions of Europe. Today, $2.8 trillion of trade goes on between China and the Belt and Road for about 5.1 billion people. This has become a very big economic driver for the Chinese. I have uh, quite a few Chinese clients. And when I ask them, how do you see the world? How do you see the world? They give me this map. It's a strange map, isn't it? It's kind of looking at the bottom end of the world going up. But the Chinese see the world like this. We are up there in the corner. We're not part of their world. This is how they see the world, and, and differently than we do in the United States. So if you think about this new power of duopoly, Washington and Beijing, think about this map and how they see the world differently than you and I relative to a global perspective. 
They are circling places like Australia, Africa, Europe, and then a large segment of South America. But this is the map the Chinese tell me that they are thinking about and working with over the next 20 years. How has this affected you all in agriculture? What's the bottom line of all of this? Well, as I look backwards, we have always been a contributor to export demand looking forward. This is agricultural exports relative to red to agricultural imports. But in the last couple of years, notice what has happened. Today, we have a $32 billion deficit where we're importing more than we're shipping out. I'm going to tell you some of this is relationship to what's going on in the duopoly, China in particular. And so this is one of the problems why U.S. ag income is falling. We need to change trade. 2020-21, of course, we, we went through a trade war in 18. We finally got an agreement with the Chinese to buy $35 billion of U.S. ag goods every year. Then we got a new administration. The Biden administration came in. And the Chinese asked and said, OK, we just signed a four-year agreement. New administration, Mr. Biden, what do we do? And they said, nothing. You don't have to worry about it. And so the Chinese were perplexed, and they walked away, and they didn't understand the change in US politics. But at that point, China decided that they needed to start diversifying their suppliers elsewhere because we were not a consistent supplier of that. And if you look at this graphic here, here is we, the United States, and here is Brazil, and Australia, Thailand, and New Zealand. And you see how China is looking to other sources of grain and food supply. I put up the map to the right here. This is uh, Brazilian, Ukrainian, and US corn imports. We are in green, the corn imports, and in, in, in orangish color is Brazil. China quickly, after they saw that the phase one agreement deal was not passed, went to other suppliers. And you can see in corn, up to that point, China was buying and importing maybe three million, two to three million metric tons of US corn each month. About there, they shifted on December 22nd and started buying Brazilian corn. That was a big deal, and that's really started the landslide or the drop, if you will, in the US market. And so today, I want you to understand what's all going on. And, and as you think about soybeans, you can see in red, this is Brazil here in red. We are in blue, and Argentina's in green. Notice how much red there is on this map over the last, uh, this graphic over the last year, relatively speaking. And I plotted the percentage of US Chinese imports relative to the United States. Now, you guys are all smart. You're out doing, of course, this disruptive business with Meristem, and they're, they're disrupting the market. China was our largest ag customer. You never treat your ag, our, our largest customer that badly, but we did. And so this is where we find ourselves today. Today, the market has lots of trouble. Bean, soybean prices have fallen near $10 a bushel, where a year ago they were closer to 13 for the main reason that China's not buying many US soybeans. Thankfully, this morning, they're back. We're seeing the Chinese buying something from the United States. But if I look at new crop sales as the middle of July, the last data that we have, we are looking at very low levels of soybean purchases. So when I look at USDA's export forecast at 1825 or somewhere at 1850, you can see that it's well above my skew line, even though the R square is not that strong early in the crop year. The bean market is concerned not only about the big crop that's in the field, but we lost our biggest customer. And that's the combination that has caused soybean prices to drop, to be clear. And then making matters maybe a little bit worse, and I'm not getting into politics. We'll leave that to another day. But we had the, the candidate and former President Trump talking about 60% of trade tariffs on Chinese imports if reelected, making the comments that we are going to tariff China so that they pay for you, our taxes, if you remember that, so that you and I would not have to pay income taxes. Now, that's all well and good. And, and I, again, if I look at this, that's fine. But as I talked to my Chinese clients just last week, they're like, 
if I buy soybeans, Dan, for December delivery and Trump is elected in November, could he sneak an import tariff on me for those beans? Could it be retroactive? They're worried. And so if you look at world trade, it's estimated at $1.4 trillion. Chinese food imports are $234 billion, or 17% of the world. 23 ag exports were you know, $34 billion to China. And now we've got Mexico, which I think in the year ahead will surpass China as possibly being the biggest U.S. ag customer for grain and food in general. Big changes. But the politics and what politicians, what they say matters. In China, they believe they're politicians because they usually do what they say. In the United States, I keep trying to tell my Chinese clients, we just talk and maybe 50% or 25% becomes real. But in their world, they don't understand this. Now, what could change? In other words, if you guys, if everybody in this room as a farmer wanted to see things turn around, right? And get better for us and maybe not so good for Latin America, how could that be flipped? Well, I've told nominees for the Ag Secretary, if you want to flip this around, let's have a phase two of the phase one agreement. Let's get China back in terms of buying $35 billion of U.S. ag goods every year. That would, again, give us the advantage, give South America a problem. But as I look at this, this would be the opportunity. The problem being is if Trump got in office on January 20th to throw out a date, it would probably take a year before this could get back in terms of a, a working agreement. So there'd be some time. Now, could you all get Trump bucks in between like he did before? It's possible. But again, the president does not have the trade authority, or the TAP as they call it, because Biden allowed that to expire back in 2021. So Congress would have to give the president trade authority to negotiate a new, a new contract, if you will, with China to get them back in this agreement. I tried to highlight you for what's going on in terms of China, our biggest customer, so you're all grounded in what's happening there. What else is going on? where our friends in Latin America continue to grow rapidly. When you look at Latin America, this is Brazilian harvested acreage and yield and Brazilian crush and exports, and you can see it moving sharply higher as you've been. If you've been to Brazil, you understand what I'm talking about. A lot of people ask me, say, Dan, what's the biggest technolo technological advantage that happened in agriculture in the last decade? What would you say? Biologics would be one, right? Maybe precision farming, maybe genetics. There's a lot of things that we can talk through technologically that has changed agriculture. To me, the biggest impact in the last decade has been one thing, a little thing called safrina, which in Portuguese means little, and I then associate it with corn. Because back in 2012, a drought in the United States trained Brazilians to plant soybeans followed by corn. It's routine now. And Brazil, within a decade, has become the world's largest corn exporter. This has been the most disruptive thing to world agriculture as I see it today. Roughly 3.5 billion bushels of corn Brazil now produces on that little thing called safrina. To me, that's the biggest issue, if you will, looking forward. And how does that manifest itself out? Well, if you look at Brazilian, I've taken corn and soybean exports. Notice how they have been growing over the last, let's call it, uh, nearly 30 years. It's been sharply higher almost each and every year. This year, not as much because of a weather problem in October, November, while our exports of corn, soybeans, and wheat have been stagnant. Again, export markets drive price. And this is the biggest uh, change that has happened during that time frame. When you think about Brazil, they're still expanding. Remember that the Brazilian farmer is still looking at more acres. And so according to USDA, we're looking at 430 million metric tons of corn and soybeans combined in Brazil. That's up 20 million metric tons this year. They are not reflecting to the market, and they continue to expand going higher. And so it's this production trend that has given the market the bearish bend because of the real and the profitability of the Brazilian farmer. But they're always in the background is this thing called weather in a changing climate. 
Ten years ago, I hired the lead forecaster from the U.S. Navy, Dr. Uh, Scott Euknes now works in my shop, and we, we talk a lot about climate in terms of what's happening. So these next few slides are from him and what he sees weather and where we're happening and what's going on. Now, again, I'm not politically wanting to get into the climate change discussion other than to say it's from God, and I think climate's been changing for billions of years. Whether man makes it or not, I'll leave it up to others to decide. Nonetheless, we know that our ocean temperatures are warming. And so when I pull up the graphic and look at where ocean temperature warming is happening, we're getting what we call these marine heat blobs. And if I look at temperatures, we just had the warmest day on record last year, last week around the world. And so as the oceans warm, I'm also getting a stagnation of the jet stream. We're not getting that angular angularity that we did before, and we're seeing more extreme weather across the world. We also have this thing called El Nino La Nina, again, an equatorial Pacific thing. We're now moving back to La Nina. This will cause a problem probably in Argentina, maybe the U.S. next year. But again, this has been changing much more rapidly than we've seen before. And so, again, we're just coming out of a phase where we had a very strong El Nino. Now we're moving to La Nina. And I think I'm worried about where world grain production will be next year, a year from now, should we get together again. My climate scientists would tell me that these are the three regions I need to pay attention to this year, Canadian prairies, Brazil, and Argentina, and of course the Black Sea. This is a graphic giving you the percent of moisture, if you will, through the end of July for the Black Sea, which has had a really strong drought in portions of Russia and much of Ukraine. Exportable grain supplies will be down there significantly as it sits today. The other thing as I move away from weather, I want to talk to you a minute about new legislation that's coming in the EU on December 30th. Are you all aware that if you're importing grain or food into the EU, it has to come from a deforested area? In other words, it can't come from any ground that's been, defor that's been had forestry occurred on it in the last 10 years. Now, it has to come from a certificate that's geospatially determined. So as I was talking two days ago to our largest poultry producer in the EU, they no longer can buy soybeans from Brazil. I can't get a certificate saying that they can. Maybe some of you in this room have signed certificates with ADM or others saying that your land is free, has been deforested for the last 10 years. If so, you're getting a 20 cent premium, probably speaking. But this is going to be very important down the road in terms of shifting trade trends. I can't source Brazilian uh, soybeans or palm oil from Indonesia, Malaysia. These are going to have to largely come from countries like the United States and Argentina. Brazil will get there, mind you, but it's not going to be for a little while. They're trying hard to catch up, but we're just not there. And so this affects Brazil, the United States. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, palm oil is going to be a big factor that's flowing this, but for all of my European clients, whether it's meat, soybeans, or palm oil, we're now buying them in the United States because I can assure it. This is helpful to us. This will help American agriculture nearby. This will push some soy trends back at us. So be aware of it. I'm just trying to point out this is something that's kind of flying under the radar and not being talked enough about within the market. So as you think about price drivers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about corn and then we'll move into soybeans, there is this sharp fall in non-U.S. corn production. This is going to boost U.S. exports next year. I think China secures more corn in the, th in the third quarter and fourth quarter this year, shift in suppliers. I still have rec record Mexican imports of corn. This leaf hoppers in Argentina and stunt disease is a big deal. Argentinian farmers are not expected to plant as much corn next year, and I will need record, the record large U.S. yields. So there is a demand story on the other side of the corn market once I decide how big is big for the U.S. corn crop. When I look at global exporter stocks to use ratios on corn, even with the big U.S. crop, we are not that large at 8.7%. And when I look at non-U.S. exporter corn production, this is non-U.S., we're down at about 186 million tons. So there's not an abundance of corn outside the United States. It's just that we got a big crop here, and it is a biggie. 
But there's a demand story forthcoming because if I look at South American corn exports, today the United States corn market is the cheapest looking forward to March, and I model it against what I call Ukraine, Brazil, Argentinian corn production and U.S. exports, there's a demand story, at least on trade for corn, beyond the U.S. harvest. So today we're at three, call it 380, 385 a bushel on corn. Yesterday we started having some of our long-term end users making some purchase. I'm not bullish, but I'm managing risk. Notice again that there is this export possibility if we think longer term. And especially in a country like Mexico, they have corn stocks today or days of use that are only 17.6 days to use, if you will. And if I look at Mexican corn exports, they are going to stay large. Mexico is a beaming opportunity for the United States, and so this is one of the positives, if you will, of the corn market looking longer term. And as I think about the balance sheet on corn, uh, we have cut acreage on corn about a million acres. We're using a yield 179.7. I rounded it up to 180 just for round purposes. You can see our end stock total here with a 2.3 export estimate of being 1747 million bushels. So, this tells me that if I bottom corn somewhere around 360 to 380 a bushel, maybe there's a post-harvest rally that'll get us back to something like 440 to 450 as we get beyond the harvest. Again, it's not a very bullish argument, but the end stocks as I've got it are still coming down because we do have demand in terms of corn and corn ethanol. Low prices do buy yield and low prices cure low prices from what we can see here today. So I wanted you to understand as we think about corn that there is a story down the road in terms of potentially once we decide how big this U.S. crop is. A little more on soybeans. China soybean imports are record large. A little bit about China. Understand that the Chinese lie more than ever. Their trade data is no longer acceptable. Census trade data is a joke. So USD and myself are now counting vessels that go into China and unload soybeans. So don't tr trust anything which is going on from China. U.S. renewable diesel demand for U.S. soybean oil. We'll talk a little bit about the producer blending credits, which started in 2025. Massive U.S. soybean exportable supplies by the fourth quarter. And Argentinian crop size may be at risk because of the La Nina going forward. Now, why do I think that U.S. planted acreage and harvested acreage could come down in the August and September reports? Well, if I look at the soybean acres and corn acres yet to be planted at the June report, notice that they were at 16.1 million acres. 2022, they were at 19. 2020, they were a little bit above 14. Notice when I look at those two years, we dropped planted acreage in the final number by 2 million acres, 2.6. And we think about 2 million acres in 2024, pretty much equally spread between corn and beans. When I look at U.S. soybean planted area, June to final change, notice that that trend is largely one that we lose acres, not find it longer term. So I'm believing anyway that there's going to be a drop in acres as we look forward based on this non-seeded acres that we had as USDA did the report for their June estimate. However, I still have this problem of China. I know China's in our market buying yesterday and today, but notice again, when we look at where the purchases are, they're very, very low. So if you're going to see a recovery in the soybean market, it needs to be based on demand from China. The only good news I can offer you as I get to August, the Chinese tend to be more aggressive buyers as we look forward, so that may be of help. China has, its real, China has real weather problems. If you look at the news, they've got some of their worst flooding on record. They've got some of their worst dryness to the north. And so I'm hopeful that today we're seeing the Chinese that start to come in and become more reliable as a buyer, which means that November soybeans may not fall below $10 until we get further down the track. But again, I need to see export sales increasing if I'm going to have that happen. We all know about renewable diesel. These are new plants. Uh, the, the platinum plant is up online. I've got Barclay, Norfolk, CGB, and Schooler yet to come online. We're seeing crush opportunities expanding, which is giving you basis bids and increases across much of the Midwest. 
Crush margins today are very strong at about $2.10 a bushel in the cash market. And so when you look at this building of crush demand, it's still ongoing and none of that has changed until I get out to about the 2026 level. And then there's some, some plants that may not get financing, but we're still looking at these firms coming online. Renewable diesel has been growing. This is uh, what you see here. This is biodiesel in, in orange. These are biodiesel plants. In green is renewable diesel. So that is still ramping up. Renewable diesel is the new fuel. It goes through a hydrocracker. It, 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 it adds an oxygen in it. And you're going to see, of course, that diesel being utilized. It gets carbon credits. The only problem on these renewable diesel plants today is that we're only operating at 49% of capacity. So we need to get more profitability. We need to have changes in the RVO or some of the things Washington is doing to get that moving up. And then you see biodiesel, renewable diesel fuel production on the right. So soybean oil demand is going up, but not as fast as we had expected two years ago. And it's largely because of used cooking oil imports by China and others. So I've plotted here Yuko imports, if you will, and you see how dramatically they have increased. Now, the Chinese are not only lying on soybean imports. They're not only looking at diversifying their suppliers. They also are the best at, of course, gaming the system. And that game today means that they're playing, they're sending over uh, vegetable oils to the United States, along with a French fry and a hot dog to get the credits. So if you have a, har a cargo of maybe virgin palm oil, maybe they throw in a French fry and a hot dog, and they call it used cooking oil. And they, of course, they satisfy what they're trying to look for. And so we've seen a tremendous surge of used cooking oil and tallow coming into the United States. Now again, Washington has been alerted to the problem. Biden has supposedly got his ear full in terms of what's happening. But if you want to have a bull market in soybeans or soybean oil, I need to somehow have certainty on, on what used cooking oil and what's happening. Job one in used cooking oil is this. Can I get someone to scientifically define what used cooking oil really is? That's a place to start. Let's get the scientists involved. And then once they're involved, let's get a, a feedstock policeman to tell us what's coming in is real or unreal. Because I don't think using palm oil in deforestation of Indonesia and Malaysia is what the program was intended for. We as US farmers are not seeing the benefits. And so we need to be vocal in terms of what's going on. Tallow imports have also been rising, but again, mostly from Brazil and other countries. But you can see tallow imports. But today, the price of soybean oil is back at where central Illinois, Brazilian soybean oil, Indonesian palm oil, Malaysian palm oil, Argentinian palm oil, we're all together. And so US soybean oil has now reached a price in which it can be exportable into the uh, market abroad. And that's helping to stabilize soybean oil between, let's call it 40 and 44 cents. And so a little bit of a change, but the, 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 the market, if you will, has come down. And we're now looking for solidarity and some regulations and what's going to be happening with tallow, use cooking oil, and, and, and the future of all of that. The other thing that changes as of uh, uh, the end of this year is going to be we're losing the blender's credit. The blender's credit was a dollar for soybean oil. If anybody blended, of course, it within a, 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 a fuel formulation. And of course, we've seen a lot of imports. This is a slide from EAI, as you can see in the corner. We're now importing about 50,000 barrels of renewal of, of used, of, I'm sorry, of biodiesel each and every day, which has had another disruptive aspect of the market. So when this becomes a producer credit, we are going to see the uh, market change. And you're going to, of course, the biodiesel will have to be produced in the US to be available for the 129 to 174 credit that will be available. But I need to have certainty uh, in terms of uh, some of the rules uh, that the uh, Z45 and others that the Treasury Department is yet to put out in terms of where we'll be going. But this could be really significant along with 8 billion gallons of demand from, Ch from Canada that likely will come online and this could shift things around. So today, crush margins on the board are very strong. We can look at world meal demand increasing 5 million metric tons, but in a general sense, 
I need to see the, the oil market come along if there's any chance for a bull market or any kind of recovery in soybeans that will be long and lasting. And that's the key that I want to leave with you. The world can take an extra 5 million metric tons of meal annually. Thereafter, it becomes a race to the bottom because I need to, of course, garner market share. So when I think about the soybean market, today Ag Resources cut our export estimate to 1775 because of China's laxness. They've not been there. And if I look at the cut, but I keep my crush number at 2425, I still have a fairly large pile of beans at 440 million bushels. If you see the modeling over here, that tells me that the market should be, no basis November, should be bottoming somewhere around the $10, the 1025 mark. We're close to that, so I think in a longer term perspective, I don't want to be bearish of beans right here. I'd come away from it. But again, I think you need to be using rallies to get sales into books unless Brazil has a crop problem next year. Lastly, I want to talk to you about the ownership in Chicago. The market is extremely short. We have record fund short positions or managed money positions in both corn and soybeans. We have, uh, of course, this graphic here shows you where the soybean market is. At some point, if all these people decide to get out, there could be at least a 50 to 75 cent rally. The market is too short today, and we've got the canoe kind of tipped to one side, which I think uh, could change as we get into the harvest and move things going forward. So be aware that the market is overdone. But if I align, and I'm not sure that this is the case, if I align the prices from June of 2010 to March of 2020, and I look at March of 2020 to the present, you can see there's some similarities. If you look at those similarities, you can see where we are today and then what happens thereafter, because oftentimes grain markets need some, of course, sideways base building to build demand and then rally to higher prices. We think the market will be more volatile than this and there will be opportunities, but it may take some time to get the next bull market ongoing relative to a new demand driver. Today, I don't see it, but it's something that you need to keep in your back of your mind. When you think about longer term price profiles, if we get weather scare rallies from Latin America or wherever, you still need to be rewarding them as you think about your farming operations going forward. So just a few summary points for you. World, ge ge world geopolitics are changing fast. And I mean very fast. The US has been the center of the world, economic, militarily, and politically, but that's all changing. If the U.S. Were, election, were held today, Trump would probably recapture the presidency. I think some of the polls are showing that very clearly. But this means that the U.S. and Chinese will clash on geopolitics, and it alters ag trading patterns going forward. World farmers are economically struggling. You're not the only ones. Maybe they're not struggling as much in Latin America. But again, there's going to be a realignment here. The only sector of agriculture which is not struggling is the cattle industry. Cattle has a story relative to supply, but you know negative margins have sparked EU and Indian protests. U.S. farmers uh, cut seeded acreage this year, and if I look at Brazilian farm bankruptcies, there's been a sharp 500% rise. So we can see this across the landscape. Climate is producing more extreme in incidents of heat and floods and droughts and stagnation of global grain yields. I think this is one of the things why I think there'll be more dy dynamism or dynamic markets ahead. So weather takes oversized importance. And Brazil has become this behemoth, if you will, producing all of this corn and soybeans with an annual growth of 2 to 3%. So Brazil is really a key that you need to stay attention to. And I think that the Brazilian growing season is now more important than we in the United States. So you need to stay on top of that as producers. So as to summarize here, and we'll get into questions, U.S. farmers need to take advantage of weather-inspired rallies to price forward. I don't have a demand driver today. If you get bull markets in agriculture, you have demand drivers like ethanol. Uh, I can go back in time and give you other ingredients uh, like China. Who is going to feed China? The old Lester Smith thing. If you look at corn, it's more bullish than soybeans in our view longer term. $35 billion of Chinese demand for ag goods would dramatically alter U.S. and Brazilian fortunes. But as I said before, that's at least a year away before we get there. Assuming that the right president ends up in, or the white candidate runs in the White House and he takes on a phase two mentality. We are on the bottom side of ag markets. 
they sometimes take time to bump around the bottom to build demand to get to another place. We are in a changeable business and agriculture and commodity markets are always changing. There's many things to watch going ahead. I hope I've highlighted for you the opportunities, but as I think about the world to come, the markets will stay volatile. The latest data I saw from the CFTC showed that somewhere close to 90% of ag trade in Chicago is now non-human. Non-human. And when boxes and machines go in one direction, they tend to keep going. And be aware of that. And so there will be opportunities. You just have to be realizing the chance that you get. Know your margins. Know when you need to pull triggers. And everybody will be fine to make it to the next cycle. There's always something that happens in agriculture which gives another opportunity. With that, I want to say thank you. We can add some questions if you have it. I appreciate your time this morning. I wish the landscape were different, but I can't tell you things that aren't true. Thank you again. Okay, we have mics on both sides. Please raise your hand. We'll get a few questions here. We're going to take advantage of this guy's knowledge while he's with us. So questions. Yeah, back there, go. Make sure you speak right. Well, I would probably bring down the value of the dollar, and it would be, uh, I think, in segmentation of the marketplace. So there'd be two different or two tiers markets. But I, I believe that that is years away because it's not going to be happening, I believe, in the next three to four years. We're talking about five to 15 years at a minimum. And again, who really wants to trade in Russian, re Russian rubles, uh, Chinese yuan, uh, Brazilian real? It's just not something that today people are anxious of. So, I'm confident, at least today, we're going to keep everything in the reserve currency of the United States. But I, again, I need to tell you that America needs to be thinking about its days ahead and how its monetary policy and how its monetary house is put together. And so that's the key that I have going forward. But uh, today, you can trade Brazilian soybeans in Juan, but only Copco trades it down in Brazil, and there's been very few cargos. It's still a US dollar dominated market. It's a good question, but I think it's years down the road, something that Putin is trying to put together that probably will take an end of the war and some other things before it even has a chance. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, so the question is just to repeat it for Sorry. everybody. Is the reason that the land market, U.S. land market, has not softened relative to the value of the U.S. dollar? Well, the reason it's not softened is because the value of the dollar is questionable. Yeah, yeah. In other words, hard, hold hard assets that would, would like, like, like land like an Argentinian farmer would do. I believe that's part of it. I believe there's also this desire that as we reach peak farmland, much like we did in Europe back 30 years ago, land prices held steady, flattened out, and then rallied another $30,000. I don't think the land market's going to see a big break here. I think we hold steady. Income comes down, but you know we can't keep going up as we have been relative to income levels, but I'm not seeing a big break, and I still believe peak farmland in the United States is key longer term. Very good. There's a question right over there. Go. Can I, can I tip the question a little bit back on you? It, so USDA only collects data and then spits it out. Do we as farmers lie more than we used to? I'm but just asking a question. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to, you know, you, data in, data out. And so I, I have meetings with farmers and they kind of go, well, I didn't tell USDA exactly what I had. Um, I just asked the question back at you. But I think the USDA's data sets are still the most trusted in the world, but they're maybe not as good as they used to be. Do you ever see us going back to any set aside? I mean, like acres taken out, like we used to. You know, I that don't would fix see, our problem. It would fix our problem, but the problem is, is as we take acres or set aside in the United States, they put more acres into production down in Brazil. We're now a global market, and so that strategy that worked back when we were 
62% of world trade doesn't work as well anymore. Now today, the United States is down to about 16% of global grain trade. So if we take right acres here. out, someone else just keeps pushing them in and there's right. still land available right. in Brazil and, and, and in Soviet Union, or the ex-pharma Soviet Union. Good question, though. Do, do you believe that, like, uh, candidate Trump, will the C-45 plan change or the carbon credits, or is that pretty balanced between each candidate? I don't know what Harris's platform is on that yet. She hasn't come out and said anything. She hasn't hardly done many interviews, so I can't tell you where the Democratic plan is sitting today. I do believe that the Trump administration would be, I don't want to say a little more adverse to ESG and all those kind of things, but I think they would be a little more adverse. They want to go back, maybe uh, not as, be as strong as carbon and other things. But I, listen, I, I think industry and the consumer drives the truck. And so they are the ones ultimately that are asking for these things. If they want to pay more, you and I as farmers should be willing to give them more, right? And I think that's where the key comes in. As I talk to corporate accounts and others, they are the ones that are asking for it, and I think that doesn't change with either administration. He's got follow. So going back to your immigration stance where we need more immigrants for the workforce, do you believe if they took down government regulation that our labor pool would go back up because there would be more benefits to individual businesses being started and so forth? I, I think that the United States, which is no longer a manufacturing economy, needs to bring in people that helps drive what we do, which is technology, innovation, and other things. We just can't open our borders to let willy-nilly come through at any time. We need to be specific in terms of imports for what we need as a country, and I think that's where I'd like to think immigration policy needs to go, to be selective, allow people to come in that have some capital, some net worth, a, a gumption to work, but also serves the need of this country in terms of what we're producing today. Thank you so much. One more question. You got one right here, right behind you. Right behind you. Is the automated trading uh, a better representation of reality, or does it only react to what it sees? So here I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> How do you program, and let's say you're an AI trading system, how do you program in that sometimes your farm can get too much rain and crops fail? And how do you program in that sometimes you get the right amount of, or get that amount of rain and crops do better, as we see with the Hurricane Burl coming up through Illinois? This is the problem with AI algo trading in that the big thing that I've been sitting in meetings with these big firms is it's a lot of it based on momentum. In other words, if the market keeps going, you keep selling it until the market pushes back. If you're buying it, you keep pushing it until the market pushes back, and then you run. And what this gives you is trends that go like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And I just want to tell you as farmers, you just need to understand how to react to the machines. It is hard to program them for everything that's happening in the world. And if China buys beans today, it was four cargoes, the market goes up. Two days ago, China bought beans, the market went down. It's hard to program for those kind of things. So momentum is the big thing that a lot of these AI systems look at. I think it's been driving the stock market. I think it's been driving the commodity market. I think it's more of what we're going to be seeing in our future.